Our webinar today will be focusing on handling difficult conversations. Now, as you know, COVID-19, the virus has greatly impacted the tourism industry. And navigating guest experience in these circumstances can prove to be very challenging. Difficult conversations are inevitable, but if we conduct proper, but if conduct properly, they will lead to reduce stress, improve relationships, and satisfactory solutions. Now, learn techniques and gain tools on how to identify resistance, um, respond to difficult situations, and reach solutions effectively and independently is a part of our presentation today. Our pre presenter today is Rachel Glover, and she is a dynamic advocate for at-risk or marginalized communities and an experienced trainer and educator for public and private sector organizations specializing in the areas of communications, diversity, inclusivity, respect in the workplace, sexuality, and other related topics. We're happy to have Rachel here with us because she can definitely facilitate difficult content conversations in a very comfortable way, which allows participants to understand and interact with the information. Thus, Rachel has the ability to create an environment of high engagement, which often results in a shift in mindset, which we want to cause today, and greater retention of the information delivered. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'll now hand over to our presenter, Rachel Glover. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm just going to share my screen now. One moment, please. Okay, there we go. Perfect. So that should be, yes, lovely. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. As Tamika said, my name is Rachel Glover. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion Training at STEM Consulting. So I work with companies um, of all different sizes across Canada, training them on diversity and inclusion, which is a huge umbrella term for a lot of really incredible topics, similar to what we're doing here today, talking about difficult conversations. So within our hour, we're going to go over some really important topics. Uh, we're going to start by having a look at some of the current research. Um, as you might have seen in the program description, you know, COVID-19 hit the tourism industry very hard and um, people had to make a lot of adjustments. Difficult conversations were something that were happening every single day, um, especially for the frontline staff who, you know, were the ones navigating this with your customers and with your clients. They're the ones having that face-to-face -face interaction. They're the one, they're the messengers of the no, the new rules and the new normal. Um, so we're going to just have a look at the research, uh, some research done by the Harvard Business Review, um, both pre-COVID and now post-COVID to see on what's changed. Then we're going to have a look at different perceptions. So we're going to have a look at what perceptions are, the challenges that come with perceptions, but also the benefits that we get from them. There we go. Uh, we're also going to review conflict because difficult conversations often stem from a conflict existing. So we're going to have a look at the different conflicts that may come up and what that can look like, as well as resistance. Uh, sometimes people can be very resistant, which is another reason why we may need to have difficult conversations. Uh, if people are always willing and able and happy to participate, um, there may not need to be a difficult conversation because people are excited and eager to create, create these solutions. So we will discuss resistance um, and how to identify that. So the specific ways that people may show that they're being resistant to something. And we're gonna wrap up the session with some communication tools and strategies for how to navigate uh, a difficult conversation, the kind of steps that you can take while you're engaging in one, whether it's with your clients or with your team, uh, within the community uh, or within your personal lives. So what we're learning here today um, will be beneficial in all different aspects of your lives. Perfect, so we're gonna start by looking at some of that research. 
There we go. So as I said, the Harvard Business Review decided to do some research. Um, they had been conducting this research for uh, decades and decades and decades, asking frontline staff um, how their experiences are with customers, how much conflict is happening, uh, how much rudeness is happening, how are they being treated, how are they treating other customers. So they did this same research, same questions. Um, they ran it again last year. And these were the stats that they found. So 78% of the frontline staff that they interviewed uh, or surveyed believed that bad behavior from customers towards employee is more common than it was five years ago. And 66 believed that bad behavior from customers towards other customers is more common than it was five years ago. So I took this research and I compared it to the last time they ran this survey, which was in 2012. And they found that the results were wildly different from one another. So before COVID, 49% uh, believed that bad behavior from customers towards employees was more common than it previously was. So that's a 30% increase in rudeness from customers towards frontline staff. Um, when it comes to how customers were treating other customers, there was a 31% um, a difference. So in the last survey, uh, the results were only 35%. So frontline staff said, 35% of frontline staff said, yeah, customers are being more rude to customers than they were five years ago. Um, and now that number has almost doubled. So the findings have shown that since COVID, customers are being more rude and more difficult, whether it is to the frontline staff or even to other customers um, that are at your organization or business. So this is very good to keep in mind because first of all, our poor frontline staff, um, you know, they, they have been through a lot. Everyone has been through a lot during COVID. It's kind of wild to look back and think of, you know, how far we've come and what we had all gone through. Um, but frontline staff definitely gets the brunt of it. They, you know, they have to tell people the, the rules and regulations that are being enforced. And, um, you know, I'm sure we've all seen it, how people can lash out at our frontline staff. So we're going to kind of discuss situations like this. This rudeness is still there, even though we're kind of getting back to normal since COVID. Um, people's behaviors and attitudes when they're coming to different businesses has not changed. In fact, it's gotten worse and significantly. So we're going to learn how to kind of uh, assess these situations, um, come up with solutions, make sure that customer satisfaction stays as a prominent goal for everybody, but we also want to make sure that ourselves and our frontline staff are being taken care of and supported. Um, because again, this can be really heavy work when, uh, when the majority, the majority of your customers are being more rude. As we see in the stats, 78% say customers are more rude than they were before. That's a huge number. That is a huge number of staff that are, um, of customers that are not uh, being polite and kind uh, we've even seen in different businesses now, there's sometimes signs that are put up that say, you know, our staff choose to be here. Um, you know, respect is, you know, if you don't respect our staff, we may not serve you. Um, you know, we see them on public transportation buses sometimes, like you're not allowed to harass the driver. Um, these are signs that we never used to have before. But this kind of rudeness, this conflict, this resistance is so prevalent that people actually have to put up a sign saying, Hey, you, you need to be respectful to our to our staff and our customers. So a lot has changed, uh, and we're going to kind of go into those the different changes that have happened. And I want to ask everyone here today: Have you experienced this? Have you noticed this personally? So in the chat box, I'd love for you to say yeah, yes, no, or maybe share an experience you have if you're comfortable to do so. So everyone, if just in the chat box, if you want to say yes or no, if you've noticed customers being more, you know, difficult and rude. And the answers coming up are 100%, yes, for sure, yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, I continuously struggle with clients having a hard time receiving the answer no, absolutely. I'm seeing yes and yes and yes over and over again. There was one no, which um, actually makes me very happy. I'm so happy somebody... And our group um, has not had this experience. That's amazing to hear. Um, but yes, other than that, we have a lot, a lot of yeses over and over and over again. Thank you everyone for uh, sharing. So yes, a lot of people have been finding this. And again, 
even though things are opening up now, right? We don't have to wear masks or it depends where you are. Uh, you know, the social distancing, the um, maximum amount of people that were allowed in a room together, you know, all of these things have changed and we're becoming more public and more safe and more healthy, but these attitudes haven't changed. So these conflicts are still going to exist and in a really, really big way. So that being said, I want to talk about perspectives. And to begin, we're going to do a little activity. So I'm going to throw an image on the screen and I want everyone to type into the chat box, whatever it is they see. So there's no right or wrong answer. I have heard all different kinds of answers. So I just want you to type in what it is that you see when I put this image up and you can be as detailed as you like. So here we go. This is our image. What is it that you see? Hey, I see a man playing sax, female face, man playing saxophone, woman's face, woman's face, person playing trumpet, woman, a woman with one eye open and one eye closed, a woman and a joker, woman's face. Perfect. Saxophone woman's face. Lovely. So we have, we have quite a bit of uh, different answers coming in. I saw a face and then I saw a man playing a saxophone musical instrument being played. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. I love using this example when we're talking about perceptions, uh, perspective, sorry. So perspective, our perspective is our way of interpreting the world around us. It's how we understand and experience things that happen to us. And it can be you know, the way we feel when we walk into a room, it could have been um, when you joined the webinar today, just from the slides or the setup of our webinar, you know, did you get an impression? Did you think, oh, like, hopefully this doesn't take too long during my lunch break? Or were you thinking, oh, this looks exciting. I'm intrigued. You have a perception about every single thing, about a conversation you had or about the chair you're sitting on. We are constantly um, interpreting the world that is around us. And our perceptions are unique to us, right? My perception is mine. Each and every one of you have your own perceptions. Um, so it's really interesting how we can all look at the exact same thing and see see something different and experience something different. I put up this image and pe some people originally saw a woman's face and some people saw um, a man playing a saxophone. And then maybe you looked a bit longer and like, oh yeah, I can see the other one too. Um, and we also had some answers that were neither of those. Um, I've even had before the um, the the mask that's kind of half black and half white. It's usually in theater, like one half smiling, the other half's frowning. I've had somebody say they see that mask. Um, again, it's kind of an optical illusion, so there's no right or wrong answers. But, you know, the fact that we can all see something and experience it differently is really important to keep in mind because this can happen in our interactions at work and in, um, people's experiences. This can be the source of a lot of conflict, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So let me give you an example. Let's say I ran a meeting with my team and I left that meeting feeling amazing. I thought, wow, uh, people were really engaged, offering their insights. Uh, we found the solution that we were meeting to solve the, the for the problem we're trying to solve. Um, it was super successful. Uh, everyone was, you know, contributing. I just feel so good. I'm such a, I'm such a great manager. That went amazing. I feel so great about this. But somebody else in that meeting left that meeting thinking, wow, Rachel didn't call upon me once. And, you know, they don't, she doesn't obviously value me. Uh, because everyone else was participating and at no point did she turn to me and ask me what my thoughts were. And I, maybe she doesn't value me. I really don't feel included. I'm really upset by how this meeting went. So we both were in the exact same meeting. We both had the ex exact same kind of, um, experience in that way. We all sat around the same table and heard the same things and were a part of the same meeting. However, my experience was really joyful and excited and happy uh, whereas my coworkers experience was not, they were really upset. They didn't feel included. Um, they might be a little bit angry about this now. So this can become really problematic when we have these different perspectives, because I'm going around thinking I did a really great job. And my coworker now thinks that I don't value them. And this now, this perception may turn into behavior. So because they think I don't value them, they're not going to say good morning to me anymore when they walk into the office. 
and they're not going to go out of their way to help support me. Um, if I'm working on a big project, they may not check in with me as much. They might start showing some microaggressions. So subtle ways of, um, showing that they're angry or, you know, they don't like me anymore. They're angry with me. Um, these are all these types of behaviors that someone can have when their perception of something is bad. So I might be starting to get treated differently. They may not want to work with me on things because I didn't value their input. So now they might avoid working with me. Um, so this team cohesion is going to be completely off. There's going to be this building conflict. Um, but meanwhile, on my end, I'm going to kind of skip into work and, you know, think I'm doing a great job. So it's very important to always talk to people there. Like I said, these different perceptions happen in every single day life on all different types of things from your mannerisms to conversations you have to projects you're working on. Um, so talk to people, nothing will ever change. If people do not know how their behavior is impacting others, um, you know, I will have no chance of improving and be better if nobody tells me how, and if I just continue thinking, I'm just this amazing uh, manager or supervisor. So when there's a difficult situation that's happening, uh, I like to see them as opportunities. They're opportunities for problem solving and to have this open communication. Um, they're called difficult conversations for a reason, because it's not always easy to approach somebody if you feel like you were disrespected, not included, if you're hurt. Um, and it's also not easy to go up to people asking for feedback. Sometimes people never think to do that with your colleagues or coworkers um, or even the customers you're serving. People don't often go up to them and say, hey, how did you find that? You know, are you happy with that outcome? Is there any, any room for improvement? How can I improve? How can I do better? How can I support you more? Um, these are the kind of talks that are super important because if we don't have these conversations, that's when this tension is going to build. Um, that staff member that thought I didn't include them, right? They are angry with me. They're not going to say hi to me anymore. And they don't want to work with me. Now I'm going to go into work and notice, wow, they're being really cold with me. They usually say good morning. Um, they're avoiding me. So they obviously don't like me. I'm going to avoid them too. I don't need to go out of my way and say good morning if they're angry at me and I don't know why. So you can see how it can build and build and build. And these tensions just get bigger and stronger. And now there's going to be a big blowout. Now there's going to be um, dysfunction on the team. Two people are not even talking or angry at each other um, over a little misunderstanding. So imagine if after that meeting I told you about, if that coworker that didn't feel included had come up to me and said, hey, you know, is everything okay? Uh, you know, I, I, you didn't include me in the meeting at all. Have I done something wrong? And I would have said, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so sorry. I so many people were offering their insights. I, I really did think that everyone had contributed. It was never my intention to leave anybody out. And thank you for bringing that up to me. I'm going to make sure to be more conscious of getting, of making sure everybody in the room had a chance to speak. And, you know, thank you for bringing this to me. Oh, okay. So the person now thinks it was just a misunderstanding, um, but I'm happy I talked about it because now, now we're both on the same page. It's as easy, it's as easy as having one conversation that can make sure there are no misunderstandings or conflicts present. Everyone can feel valued and heard. You can understand their different point of view and problems can be solved. It's also really important to approach with an open mind. So if you come up with a conclusion uh, before the entire problem has been laid out to you, it's more, most likely that you don't have all the information. Um, for example, in this, the example I just gave you, right? We didn't have all the information. Somebody thought one thing because of their perception and had these beliefs because of it. And then they started behaving in ways because of that, but they didn't have all the information. It wasn't that I don't value them or don't like them. It was, it was just a busy room, a lot of people talking, and I wasn't really paying attention to everyone who had a chance to speak. It's also really a really good tactic to put yourself in other people's shoes. So if we're talking about a frontline focus, let's say, um, you know, for during COVID, it could be something like, you know, our, our pools are closed because of COVID right now. Well, somebody might be really angry, super upset because they really wanted the pool with their kids. And this is, you know, outrageous. Um, you may not be able to solve this problem for example, because the pools have to be closed. It's the law during COVID. Everything had to shut down these public spaces. People aren't allowed to go swimming, but you can put yourself in the, their shoes and see, well, you came here expecting to use the pool with your kids. Maybe it's winter. Like what else are they supposed to do indoors right now when everything else is shut down? They thought the facilities would at least be open. They're not. 
Um, so you can talk to them again, have the chat with them. Hey, I know this is really, um, I know this isn't what you were expecting. I can imagine how frustrating this must be for you. We have to comply with the laws. Um, we, we are eagerly looking forward to opening up our pool again. Um, and, you know, offer a suggestion, maybe, you know, maybe the kids can play with this or do this or go there, but approach with an open mind, instead of seeing somebody who's being really resistant or angry or close minded, uh, close minded, maybe we don't have all the information yet. And maybe we should try putting ourselves in their shoes, uh, to understand what they're going through because maybe their angry anger is very valid. They're taking it out on the wrong person. Um, the understanding where somebody's coming from can be a really good tip on um, navigating these kind of conflicts and reaching solution um, and making sure even if you can't change the, you know, even though you can't open the pool, the customer might feel way better just from having that conversation with you. Perfect. So I would love to talk about conflict and difficult conversations. So I'm going to ask everyone to go into the chat box again. And I want to ask you what thoughts come to mind when you think of conflict or what did you learn about conflict when you were growing up? You can throw out single words, write a sentence. So just when you think of conflict, what comes to mind? What do you think about? The first comment says it's uncomfortable. Self-regulation, yelling, disagreements, anger, frustration, not getting along, disagreements, tension, stressful, trying to avoid it, anger, solutions, big egos. Yeah, these are all wonderful uh, comments. Effective ways to have difficult conversations that either make you uncomfortable or nervous. Personal feelings are involved. Absolutely. Rudeness. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, difference between understandings. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And these are the comments I usually get when I'm talking to groups about difficult conversations and conflict. It makes people uncomfortable. It makes which is why people tend to avoid them because it's, it can be scary sometimes um, when we're talking about big egos or maybe loud people. Um, you may not want to engage in these difficult conversations. Maybe there's a fear of being disrespected or bulldozed. You know, someone's just going to be bigger and louder and it's not worth it. Um, people can just be rude. They can be mean. These can be really stressful situations. So these are very common findings for people when we're talking about difficult conversations and conflict. Um, and difficult conversations are challenging. As I've already mentioned, they're called difficult for a reason because they're not just easy or else we'd all be having them and solving all the problems and things would be nice and easy. They can be an uncomfortable, uh, they can be uncomfortable and a source of anxiety for the involved parties. And, uh, you know, we even have a body response to it. Sometimes people go into the fight, uh, flight or freeze mode. So sometimes when there's a conflict or um, resist, um, sorry, conflict that's happening, sometimes people may freeze and just kind of shrink a little bit and get quiet. Sometimes people might just leave, like I'm getting out of here. Nope, I'm not, I can't engage with you. Or they're going to fight back and maybe become that kind of that ego comes out and they're going to be louder and maybe a little more aggressive. So those are some of the ways that our bodies can just respond. And um, we don't, usually don't have a choice on that fight, flight, or freeze. Um they just happen. It's just our body's natural instinct to go into these modes when we are stressed out or struggling. Um, and people tend to avoid these difficult conversations because of all of these reasons, because of our body response and how it feels and that sometimes anxiety and discomfort over having them. Sometimes it's easy. People feel like it's easier to just avoid them altogether, which is extremely problematic. I already kind of gave you an example of that meeting. If me and that staff member didn't talk, these tensions would build and build and build and build. Now there's going to be massive conflict. Um, whereas a quick conversation at the beginning could have solved it right from the get-go. So conflict is a very healthy, natural, and necessary aspect of our lives. It, we need them. We need to have conflict all the time. It's how we have innovation and problem solving. It's how we come up with new ideas. We have to be able to identify barriers that exist. And people are not always going to agree. We have different perceptions, right? We can be at the same exact in the in the same exact situation, and two people will experience it very differently. But that's the benefits of our different perceptions. That's how we can 
come up with the next biggest solution. If everybody's thinking the same way and there's a problem, you're not going to have different ideas. Everyone's going to be like, I think we should do this. Oh yeah, I totally agree. I think we should do that too. That's what you're going to do. But when you have people that can see the problem from different angles and in different ways, and they work together at solving it, you're going to have the best absolute solution. You're going to have more innovation. That team now is going to be closer and stronger um, and, and work together better, more satisfaction. People are feeling valued and heard. Um, so conflict is a necessary thing. It's when conflict isn't um, handled properly, which we've all had experience with. That's what's leading to this um, discomfort is, you know, I'm, I don't want to be yelled at or disrespected. Um, I don't want my boundaries to be pushed. I want, you know, I don't feel safe during un, uh, difficult conversations. Sometimes my body does go into this fight, flight, or freeze mode, but conflict doesn't have to be this, you know, big, scary thing all the time. It can be um, just a conversation. It can be a disagreement, essentially, you know, we can respectfully talk this out. We can come up with solutions. Um, and there are tips and tricks on how to do that, that we will talk about shortly. Perfect. So conflict does need to be normalized and supported. This is something you can do on your team and within your organization. Talk to them about it. If there's a conflict on your staff or on your team, deal with it immediately. Get like invite those open conversations. Oh, are you feeling um away because of how this person did that? Go talk to them. I can come with you for support, but we, you know, encourage people to talk about it right away. Go towards the conflict so it's dealt with. Otherwise, it can hide everywhere. The conflict, disagreements, tension. If you're not having these conversations, they're still there. They don't go away, but they're hiding and they're growing and they're inf infiltrating all parts of your life. So it's always best to just have those conversations and get it handled. So let's discuss resistance. So what is resistance? Resistance is the refusal to accept or comply with something. Um, and it's the attempt to prevent something by action or argument. So we have all seen different types of resistance, uh, especially during COVID. Uh, one example was people refusing to wear a mask, even though it was mandated and required, and people had signs on their buildings saying mask required. We saw this all the time, right? We saw people that just refused to, they're not wearing a mask, they don't care. Uh, so that's one form of resistance. You know, they're well aware of what was expected of them, um, and they're refusing to comply and they won't do it. Um, and they might even, uh, sorry, attempt to prevent themselves from having to through argument, through action, you know, saying, I know my rights and, you know, sometimes police would have to be involved. So that's one form of resistance that we saw during the pandemic. Why are people resistant? So there are a lot of different reasons why people might become resistant, whether it is against customers that we are serving or people on our team or even people in our lives. So for one reason, it could be due to prejudice or bias. So it's beliefs that people have on certain things of being either good or bad. It's their own personal beliefs. Uh, you know, if they had experience with um, let's say a young person being really mean and bullying and hurting people. If a young person walks into their business, they might immediately think, no, I don't want to serve them because they're going to be trouble. They kick them out of here. They're not going to be welcome here because I, you know, all these kids are trouble. That's kind of an example of a prejudice or bias. It's a belief. It's like a generalized belief. These things are good. These things are bad because of my personal experience and because of my personal beliefs on that subject. Another reason why people may be resistant is due to stubbornness. They just don't want to change their mind. Sometimes people are just stubborn. They can be sensitive or hurt. So that woman in the example in my meeting, she was hurt. She was hurt that I didn't include her. And um, because of that, she became resistant. She didn't want to work with me anymore. She didn't want to say hi to me. She didn't want to talk to me. She became resistant due to some sensitivities and hurt feelings that she had. Another reason people can be resistant is because of the differences in perceptions and values. So they see things differently and they don't agree and they're resistant to um, maybe even seeing other people's point of view, which is a super important aspect of this, which we talked about putting yourself in someone's shoes, trying to see what they're going through. Um, well, when people have a different perception or value and they don't want to see your point of view, resistance can happen there. Conflict can happen there as well. Sometimes there's a competition for scarce resources. 
We saw that a lot during COVID as well. Um, you know, when we had limited spacing, space for dining, um, you couldn't have a full, you know, if you are a tourism operator that does accommodations, um, you weren't allowed to be at full capacity. So there's limited rooms, there's limited seats at the restaurant, um, limited spaces for any indoor place. Um, so this competition for scarce resources led to a lot of conflict and resistance. One example I have from a, um, a hotel was when their restaurants couldn't be at full capacity and they had one guest that caused, you know, I was very upset, very loud, caused a really big scene because they wanted to go for dinner and, you know, it had already been, the spots had already been reserved and, you know, they saw empty seats and tables and they were, you know, well, no, I, I, where else am I supposed to eat? I can't wanted to come here for dinner you know, they said, well, due to our limited seating, it's by reservation only. We're fully reserved. We're not even allowed to fit more people into the restaurant. There's nothing we can do. So they were very angry and saying, you know, nope, I'm a, as a, I'm staying at the hotel. I deserve to have a seat here. Um, like this isn't okay. So they were very resistant. They didn't want to kind of problem solve. The only answer for this person was you're giving me a seat or this is going to be a problem. So that's resistance. Cause there's no, um, this person isn't open-minded. They're not trying to change. They're closed-minded. They're not even open to any other options, which is what resistance can be. Sometimes it can happen due to misunderstandings um, or unfulfilled expectations. So again, that example of like the pool being closed, um, sometimes people can be really resistant then because they expected something and that's not what happened. And uh, they're really angry about it. And sometimes it's a fear of getting feedback. So sometimes uh, people may be resistant to having, you know, that conversation because they don't want to hear, maybe they, they don't want to hear what you have to say about them or what your experience was. So sometimes just that fear of even getting feedback on themselves is enough for people to be resistant. So what does that look like? If we're talking about resistance specifically, what kind of behaviors are those? So it could be rude comments or behavior, which frontline staff, right? They have had a lot of experience getting rude comments and experiencing rude behavior from guests. Um, refusing to follow instructions. Um, it can also be attacks. So pe you, people can be attacked um, when they're really angry and resisting something. So people can show aggression. That could be anything from rolling their eyes to threatening you. People may deny that the problem even exists. Well, this is silly. I'm going to do it anyways. Um, they just kind of in denial and refusing to believe the information being shared. Um, sometimes they will refuse to recognize any responsibility. So that's say they did something and it's just, nope, that wasn't me. Um, that's not my fault. It's their fault. They like to, sometimes people will blame others instead of just reflecting on themselves being like, yeah, I did that. I can see I can see why that uh, was challenging, why that caused a barrier, why that was upsetting. Um, so instead of reflecting on their own behavior and taking ownership, uh, they'll refuse to re recognize any responsibility. And sometimes, again, they might even blame other people. Well, it was their fault, not mine. Um, again, deny cred credibility of the messaging. So if someone's sh if you're sharing like a rule or a policy or a law, uh, they might deny that it exists. That's not a real law. That nope, I know my rights. That's not real. Or um, even though your manager said that, that's not right. I'm going to do this anyways. Sometimes they'll even attack the credibility of the, me the messenger. And as I already mentioned, the frontline staff kind of are the messengers. They're the face. They're that first and last interaction with people. They kind of have to share um, information with your guests. So sometimes people will attack the credibility of the messenger. Um, they can even um, resort to slander. So if somebody is resistant, uh, they might go online and say bad things about you or your company or your organization or their experience. That's one form of resistance as well. Um, and then foot dragging. So one example could be at a grocery store and there's a big lineup and somebody kind of wanders over with their groceries and butts in line. And they uh, the, the cashier says, sorry, sir, the lineup actually starts down there. This form of resistance could be them being like, oh, really? Yep. The, see this long lineup of people waiting? The, that's the lineup. And that's the foot dragging. They'll slump over and drag their feet, walking to the back of that line as if it's Mount Everest, as if it's this huge, huge inconvenience to wait in line with everyone else for your turn. 
um, walk that 10 feet to the back of the line. Uh, so that's another example of how resistance can come up. Um, so let's discuss some tools and strategies that we can use when we are experiencing people that are resistant or uh, difficult or uh, have a conflict. How can we handle these situations? How can we make a lemonade out of lemons? How can we turn this around um, and make sure everybody, you know, everyone is feeling good about the situation? Maybe we can resolve something, even if we can't resolve it. How can we change that person's perspective of what's happened? Even though the pool's closed, maybe that person can still walk away feeling value, feeling happy about that interaction with you. Is it difficult? Yeah. Yeah, these can be very difficult, but is it impossible? Absolutely not. And with practice, it will become easier and easier. If you challenge yourself to engage in these difficult conversations um, with your friends, with your family, with your coworkers, they will become easier over time. And especially if you come at them um, with a respectful mind and heart, you know, it's like, I'm not trying to fight, but there is conflict that we need to address. If the goal is to problem solve and make sure everybody feels safe and respected, these conversations, these difficult conversations can be respectful, even though they can be difficult, respectful, um, and benefit everybody that is involved. So I want to begin by discussing what the customer needs. Customers need to feel valued. They need to feel appreciated. They want a personalized approach and they need to know you care. So if we are remembering all of these things when we're interacting and navigating these difficult conversations with our clients and customers, remember that of these four things, even if you can't change the situation, even if you know there, there may not be a solution that you know of, make sure they feel valued and appreciated and give the personalized approach. So don't be robotic. Um, bring yourself to work, bring your authentic self, whoever that is, and just talk to them like they're a human being as opposed to, well, our policy says this, I can get my manager if you'd like. You can still say those words to say, uh, you know, absolutely. I understand. I understand your frustrations. We do have a policy in place that is supporting these things. Um, but I can talk to my manager. Can I get your number? It's just, it's just putting a little bit of yourself in the messaging, which makes people feel heard, seen and valued. All of those things will feel appreciated. Like they're talking to another human being that cares about them. And that's essentially what the customer wants. They need to know that you care about them and their experience. So if you're relaying, if you're making them feel all of these ways during this conversation, it almost every single time will be a successful conversation. Again, even if you don't have the solution, that person may leave just feeling better. And they went from writing a bad review to, you know what, I was so disappointed that the pool wasn't open, but you know, they, the staff were so lovely. Um, you know, they, they found something for my kids to do. I, it's, I feel so much better. Perfect. So one conversation can change everything. It doesn't have to always be these ongoing, let's return back to this problem. Let's talk again in a week. Most of the time, it'll just be one simple conversation that can solve all of these problems that can change everyone's perception and experience on what happened. So that being said, let's go into the strategies for navigating difficult conversations. Uh, I'm going to present to you a couple of different points that you'll do in order when engaging in these difficult conversations. Um, and I just, I had a quick question pop up. Um, it says a quick question to Rachel. If I say, I understand your frustration. However, we do have a policy in place. And then they say, if you really understand, you'd be able to change this. How do I respond to a comment like that? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So what I would say in that thing is, again, remembering what the customer wants. They want to feel valued, appreciated, like you care. Um, so I wouldn't say, well, that's our policy. I'd said, uh, yes, and you absolutely make a great point. I'm going to take note of this and, and pass it to my manager so they can maybe review the policy. Um, it's just saying, I'll pass it along. Sometimes you can say, I don't make the policies. I, as I'm just, I have to follow the policies that my organization that has hired me put into place, but let them know that, you know, you can escalate it. I, I, I will pass this along this comment along to somebody who does have, um, a say on the different policies and they can take it into consideration. Um, whether they will take it into consideration or not is not your problem at all. Yeah. It's just letting them know that it's not, I can't do anything. So bye. Just 
you know, make some notes, pass it along. And again, your manager may not do anything like, yeah, okay, no, no, I don't care. Well, but that's, that's your manager's now job to do, to make that decision. So let your, yeah, let the guests know that you care and you, you, you're not just trying to get them away from the desk. Even if you are, it's saying, you know, I hear you and I want you to know that I, I care about what you care about and we'll work on this together. Perfect. So difficult conversations. Um, we're going to start by moving towards, there we go. Moving towards the conflict. Again, we don't want to avoid the conflict at all. If you see it, if you overhear customers or clients, you know, complaining about something like they're looking through your brochure saying, oh my gosh, you know, this is $200 last, last year it was only, you know, 160 or 180. Uh, you know, don't just be like, oh gosh, they're complaining about the prices and put your head down and keep working. Go, go towards that conflict, go to, up to that customer and say, Hey, you know, is everything okay over here? They'll share. You know, I noticed your prices have increased since last year and then you can share. Absolutely. I know um, we, it was a tough decision to make, but due to COVID and all the changes that have happened, we have had to raise our prices in order to stay open as a business in order to keep running. We had to make these changes because of all, all the loss that everyone experienced during COVID, including ourselves. Um, we would have loved to keep our prices at that same lower level. Um, but it was, uh, it's what we had to do to, you know, to stay open as an organization, sometimes just sharing that. And then they go, oh, okay. You know, they may, they may still not like that the prices increased, but their perception now, instead of being like, oh gosh, wow, they're raising the prices. It's kind of like, oh, well, I understand, you know, it's changing how they feel about the issue. So go towards the conflict. As I said, without conflict, problems will hide everywhere. Tensions will grow. Things can build up and get worse. And conflict is healthy, human, and normal. So we're going to go towards it. And you can also let people be a part of the solution. So it's in some situations, especially in a frontline situation, you, you typically will have to offer a solution or try to find a solution. But sometimes you can work together. You know, if your conflicts with a coworker, don't tell them what the answer is. Work together, solve the problem together, figure out what works best for everyone. So yes, we're gonna move towards the conflict. And the next thing we're going to do is listen. And this is, this is a detailed point because we are going to practice active listening. Active listening is when you're not thinking about how you're going to respond to what they're saying, which a lot of people do. They're hearing information and they're kind of like, oh yeah, like I remember to say this because that's how I want to answer. If you're thinking about how you're going to respond, you're not actually listening. So we're going to be very quiet. We're not going to interrupt. Um, you know, it's good to obviously show you're listening through head nods or gestures, but don't interrupt them. Don't be like, oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, I agree. Just be silent, look at them, do this active listening, let them share, let people vent, share all of their frustrations. Um, this alone can be a really great tool to deescalate a situation. A lot of times people just want to feel heard and they sometimes they just need to vent and they'll feel better just from talking about it. Um, another thing that you can do is just be quiet. Let there be these uncomfortable silences or awkward silences. Um, because that's often when people will start sharing even a little bit more and be comfortable in the awkward silence, right? Don't let it be awkward. Just sit there um, and you can nod. Uh, one word that can really help is just saying really. Saying the word really can help people open up more. So they're sharing, they're sharing. There's a silence and you can go, really? Yeah, yeah, I know. I couldn't believe it either. So that's a little uh, back pocket tip for you. Just saying the word really can help people open up even more. And again, venting can be a really great tool for de-escalation de for any situation. Perfect. Here we go. Um, empathy. So we want to show empathy when we're having these conversations. So that's using a uh, language saying, um, you know, I understand, I'm sorry, I can appreciate. It's kind of understanding what your what the person you're talking to is going through. It's it's an acknowledgement of their feelings, their thoughts, or their attitudes. Um, again, it's putting yourself in their shoes and kind of saying, I I can understand how frustrating this must be. Um, let me see what I can do to offer a different solution. So it's using that I language. 
um, and, you know, caring about your customer, because again, that's what they, that's the goal for them. They want to feel cared about and valued. The next step is to recap the situation. So reiterate it to them, making sure that you do have all the information. Uh, you can understand everything perfectly. There's no misunderstandings there. So say, you know, I understand that last night, other guests kept you awake um, and that you came here to rest and that you're, uh, you know, I, I can understand how upsetting that would be if you came here to get rest and then you didn't sleep all night because other guests were being noisy. You know, we do have quiet hours after 10 PM. Um, they obviously did not respect those quiet hours. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, my apologies that you had to deal with these disruptive guests last night. So just recapping the situation also shows that you did hear them. And then they might say, no, 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 it wasn't last night. This happened two nights ago. You know, it, it just, they're making, it's making sure you both are on the exact same page on the incident or whatever it is that has happened. Okay. There we go. Um, and then you want to take action and present a solution. So you, we all need to be able to have that comfort and confidence in offering a solution or thinking of something. Sometimes it might be, I'm going to pass this along to my manager. I'm going to let them know the situation, right? If we're not able to make any decisions ourselves, if we are share that. So I'm so sorry you didn't get any sleep last night. I know the unit of the room that was being disruptive. I am going to personally talk to them myself right now and let, remind them of our quiet hours and that they had disrupted guests. I'm going to tell all the other staff so you won't have to repeat this situation to anybody else again. I'm going to inform everybody of what your experiences was. Um, and I will be sending staff down that quarter, quarter, the night staff, you know, once an hour, just to ensure that, you know, the quiet hours are being respected and that you can give your, get your sleep. Can I also offer you earplugs? You know, it's just offering all of these solutions and showing you care. So take action and present a solution. As I already mentioned, if this is a conflict with co coworkers, um, come up with a solution together. And the last point is the follow-up. So it's really important to follow up with people to make sure that the solution was dealt with, right? The, that difficult conversation was successful. Um, this can be, you know, that person come down next day and I see them and I say, hi, you know, hello, um, Mr. Green. Um, were you able to get more rest last night? Um, we were checking on the units and um, when we did, we didn't notice any disruptions. Were you able to get more sleep? Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad. And I'm so sorry for that first night you had here. Just following up, you know, again, it's showing that you care and you value that customer. They're going to be happier. Uh, even if people were noisy again that night, it's showing you care, not like, okay, I took care of this. Whatever happens, happens. You just, oh, was it noisy again? Yes, it was. Okay. You know, maybe come up another solution. Well, we're going to put a note on this this other guest file, you know, they won't be welcome here since they were so disruptive. We'd also like to give you a free breakfast. You're st these are still opportunities to change things around. So even if the problem didn't get solved, it's another opportunity to try to solve it and to try to change that person's experience. Okay. And one important thing that to consider when we're talking about difficult conversations is body language. Body language is a huge part of difficult conversations. So um, we are wrapping up. So I'll do the last two minutes here. Uh, I'd like everyone to type into the chat box um, on how you think these two people are feeling or what their roles are. Let's say you're at a meeting with two people. You're, you're at a meeting, let's say with a group of people, but you're looking across from you and these are the two people you see. How do you think each of these people are feeling based on the way they're sitting in the chair? I have one that said impatient, I see insecure, confident. Someone said the red shirt, defensive. On the left, nervous. On the right, excited. Left is uninterested. Right is happy to be there. The person on the left is uncomfortable. The person on the right is confident. The one on the left seems meek or reserved. Uh, the one on the, the individual in red is closed off, ner um, nervous. The person in the blues engaged, engaged. Yeah. So all the comments are kind of aligning, thinking, saying, you know, the person in the red kind of seems nervous, uncomfortable, um, kind of cold, shut off, not contributing. The person on the other side uh, seems animated, confident, engaged, um, receptive, um, all of these things. Absolutely. So the, the, by the way, these are just our perceptions, 
based on how people are sitting. We don't know anything about these two people other than their body language. And we all gathered a lot of data just from that body language. And that happens the exact same way when we're having these difficult conversations and when we're interacting in any single aspect of our lives, our body language tells a whole different story. So most of our face-to-face -face communication is actually through body language. When we're delivering any message, it's only 7% of that message that is our words. So people are hearing, so only 7% of the messaging people get is from the words. The rest, the 93 other percent is from our body language. So the face and the eyes are the most expressive means of uh, body communication. And the body language must be in tune with your words and tone, or you're sending a mixed and confusing message. So it's important to keep body language in mind. Because for example, let's say, you know, you're talking to a guest and you say, you know, um, I'm so sorry that this was your experience. This was our policy. I can send a message to our manager and let them know that, um, you know, you're, that you're unhappy and we'll see what we can do. That's not really coming off authentic or genuine. Um, this person doesn't really feel cared about. I'm not bringing that personal touch. Um, the cu customer might be like, what? No, I want to talk to somebody now, right? They're not feeling respected as opposed to if you dial up your body language, you know, I'm so sorry, this is your experience. Uh, I'm going to send a message right now to my manager. I'm going to let them know what happened. This is our policy, but I will escalate this to see if there's anything we can do. Um, it's just those personal touch, maybe more eye contact, um, smiling a little, making your voice a little warmer. Um, but our personal touches are just like our perceptions. They're individual to each of us. So the way I might bring myself to work and to these conversations, it can look different for you, but it's just showing that you care to people. So your body language, your tone of voice, it matters in a big way. Another little trick for body language is that if you're talking about someone's behavior, maybe bad behavior, don't point to them being like, you know, you're not allowed to take your mask off uh, or, you know, you've been coming in late a lot. Point away when you're talking about the bad behavior because it's removing that behavior from the person so people can be a little more open to receiving it. You know, we're not supposed to be taking our masks off. I've been noticing you coming in late 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 a few times this week. So it's kind of removing the person from the issue. So they might be able to, um, uh, to discuss it in a more open way. And our last slide before we can go into some questions before we wrap it up is not to let dissatisfaction walk out the door. So as frontline staff, your interaction with the customer is probably the first and last impression they're going to have. And your interaction will have an impact it is, you know, when people walk in, remember I told you we all have perceptions happening all the time. So when people walk into your business and this is the frontline staff, you, they have a perception on you and the business and through the interactions they have with you, uh, they will also have this feeling or um, interpretation. So you have a huge importance as frontline staff on how people are perceiving their experience and their business. Um, the personal relationship for the customer is key to the overall experience. So I told you all the things that matter to customers. They want to feel valued, cared about, supported, and they have that personal touch. So this is a key relationship that frontline staff have in um, being known as a welcoming place that they had a good time. Or if, you know, people didn't care about us, this is awful. I'm never coming back. Frontline staff have the power to change that around. They can change somebody's perception before they leave um, your organization and, you know, write a bad review online, they have these tools and it can just be one simple conversation that can make the world of a difference for people. So we're going to fix the problem before it is announced and shared on social media. Lovely. And thank you, everyone. Um, we will open it up for some Q&A now. Tamika. Yeah, can... we have some questions and I'm going to be taking the last one because it, um, it is related to body language. Is there a way to determine body language over the phone or through email? Yes. Yeah, so over the phone, it would be your tone of voice. So you can listen and you can hear if people are maybe, you know, you can hear if somebody's annoyed by the way they're speaking or if they're warm and, uh, and want to help. Like I, I can even do examples. So, um, hi, yes, I'm so sorry that you've had this experience. I'm going to look into it. Is there anything I can do to you for you? Or, yeah, I'm sorry this experience happened to you. I can look into it. Somebody will get back to you. We can send an email in a little bit. 
It's your tone of voice that can make the world of a difference over the phone. Email, email is very challenging because, you know, we even see this in text and email. Sometimes somebody might send a text and somebody else will read it as like an insult. And it's like, no, you're reading it wrong. It was meant to be read like this. So (laughs) emails are definitely more challenging, but um, tone of voice can be um, a telling sign through phone calls. Another question for you, Rachel. It says, as the youngest person working in my department, I struggle with clients questioning my professional integrity because of my age. What is your best recommendation for handling a situation with a client that is using a very belittling tone and not considering the given information seriously? Yeah, that's a great question Um, and comes up a lot. There is um, this age bias. Um, which can go both ways, but sometimes people think younger professionals, you know, oh, they don't have enough experience. They're not qualified. They're way too young to, you know, be here. I want to talk to someone older, more, you know, um, which is completely wrong and unfair, of course. So I'm sorry that you have this experience of age bias um, at your workplace. Um, and this can show up in different ways. So, you know, if it is among colleagues, it's, uh, you know, showing, I, I could say, show the good work you're doing. Show, you know, if they question you, just say, no, this is facts. Just, you can be respectful, but by saying, no, I I'm accurate with my findings. The work I do is great. Um, I know what I'm doing. Um, having other people support you too, like even your managers or supervisors or other staff members saying, no, they are the most, they are qualified employee that we very value. We very much value on our team and you are in great hands if it's coming from, um, a customer or client. So, so, you know, someone's coming in there and, and belittling you for your age. Um, that's a really tricky situation to navigate. If your business has a policy, for example, sometimes it's, you know, we don't put up with any harassment. Uh, so it could just be say, you know, it depends how, how much the belittling, belittling is happening. If it's, if it's necessary, you can say, you know, I, I'm a valued employee and I, I'm, I am capable and willing to help you, but I, you, you can't speak to me that way. You know, you are allowed to have your boundaries. I said that at the beginning, that it's important to take care of yourselves when we are navigating these difficult conversations. That doesn't mean that you get to, to be stomped all over. Uh, doesn't mean people get to treat you disrespectfully. So it's okay to leave and take care of yourself or to say, you know, I, 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 I won't be spoken to this way. Um, I'm happy to help you if you want to, you know, change your tone of voice. If you, if you're going to talk to me respectfully, I can help you. If not, I'm going to have to walk away. Um, so it's having your own boundaries in the situation, having people on your staff support you and back you up. Um, sometimes it could just be showing people on your team that you are qualified. So if you just started and they're judging you for your age, um, you can prove them otherwise do, you know, just by doing your job that you are qualified and capable of doing. And if they still, um, you know, if they're still coming at you that you're not doing qualified work, that might be when you need to have a difficult conversation. This is a great opportunity for difficult conversations. You know, I understand that you've mentioned it a few times that um, that you've been questioning my my professional integrity because of my age. Um, have I done anything? Have I done it? Have any of my behaviors shown you that I can't do this job? Is there anything happening? Is everything okay? Sometimes using the words, is everything okay? makes people reflect on their own behavior. Maybe they don't realize that they've been um, treating you disrespectfully and it makes them kind of reflect for a second. You're like, oh yeah, I'm okay. But um, no, 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 your, your work's fine. Like sometimes you just, just question people. So in, invite those difficult conversations if it's people on your team. Um, but if it is a customer that's coming in just you know in and out really quick and they're belittling you, again, it's talking about policies, having other staff support you and keeping your own boundaries uh, to make sure you are feeling safe and um, not sacrificing your own health and well-being um, during these interactions, if that answers your question. I think, yes, she did respond to say that she's very happy with the response that you have given. Um, I think we have exceeded the time limit for the presentation, but it was an awesome presentation. And the takeaway that I hope that we have um, this eve, this afternoon is that conflicts are healthy and that we should make them the norm. When you said that, I was like, wow, make them the norm. So thank you again so much, everyone.